Hi, I'm Qing Lu, a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. Today I'm going to talk about our paper, Is My Favorite New Movie My Favorite Movie? Probing the Understanding of Recursive Noun Phrases. This is joint work with Hua, Dao Xing, Harry, Mariana, and Chris. Let's start with an example. Here are a sequence of colorful balls. Now, if I ask you to point to the second green ball, which one would you choose? Well, most likely you'd say this one, the second among green balls, right? But interestingly, sometimes children would point to this one instead, the second and the green ball. The difference lies in the interpretation of recursive noun phrases, or NPs, with more than one pronominal modifiers. Linguists found that children sometimes make the intersective interpretation error on the left, whereas adults prefer the recursive interpretation on the right. In this work, we wonder, do language models make similar errors? Specifically, we want to answer four research questions. A. Is the knowledge of how to interpret recursive MPs present in language models? B. If not, is this learnable? C. What can language models learn from recursive MPs? And D. Is the knowledge useful for downstream tasks? As a spoiler, our short answers are no, yes, linguistic features, and yes. Now, if you're interested in how we found those answers, I invite you to continue watching. To address the understanding of recursive MPs, we designed three task formats, single-premise textual entailment, multi-premise textual entailment, and event plausibility comparison. In the formalization, we're going to use the following notations. The canonical recursive MP consists of the determiner, modifier 1 and 2, and the noun. And for the first two tasks, we also need a sentence prefix called P, which could be this is, he is, or she is, etc., depending on the context. Now let's formalize the first task, SBTE. It has the same format as the conventional NLI task. Given a premise and a hypothesis, determine if the former entails the latter. In our case, a regular expression representation of the example looks like the premise contains the prefix and the original MP, and the hypothesis contains the prefix and one or none of the modifiers and the noun. So for example, this is my new favorite movie does entail this is my favorite movie, whereas this is my favorite new movie does it. Intuitively, this task tests if an MP entails a part of itself, and this holds for most simple MPs, but recursive MPs offer interesting counterexamples like in 1B. The second task is MPTE. It has the same format as SPTE, except that now there are more than one premise and the task is to determine if they collectively entail the hypothesis. So in regex, an example looks like this. Premise 1 is still the prefix plus the whole MP. Premise 2 is the prefix, the determiner plus a different noun called M2. And the hypothesis has the composition of M1 or M2 and M2. So for example, premise 1 could be he is a skillful American violinist, and premise two could be he is a father. Suppose both of them are true. Then it's also true that he is an American father, but not necessarily true that he is a skillful father, right? So intuitively, this task tests if a modifier can be freely decomposed from an MP and composed with another noun. Finally, the third task, EPC. The input is two events, E1 and E2. And the output is whether E2 is more equally or less plausible than E1. So in regex, notice that the two events only differs within the MP, but has the same event content, E. So E1 contains one or none of the modifiers, plus a noun, and E2 contains the entire MP. For example, compared with the actress, the famous former actress is more likely to be known by everyone, equally likely to live in France, and less likely to star in many latest movies. Intuitively, this task is testing the influence of adding modifiers on different attributes of the noun. With the three task formats, we construct a new dataset called Recursive Noun Phrase Challenge, or RNPC. 
It's a crowdsourced and expert validated challenge set. And here we show some basic statistics, but please see our paper for more details. Now with the data set, we're ready to investigate our four research questions. Recall that the first one is, is the knowledge of recursive MPs present in language models? To answer this question, we directly evaluate state-of-the-art language models, including BERT, Roberta, BART, and GPT-3, fine-tuned on existing benchmarks of the same format as each of our tasks. The assumption is that fine-tuning would allow us to elicit models' potential knowledge about recursive MPs in the required format. Here, we show the performance of models on these benchmarks and on our tasks denoted by blue and purple respectively. And the dotted line stands for the chance on our task. So for SVTE, we see that models with decent accuracy on SNI and MNI perform only around chance on our task. And this is the case for all three tasks. So in short, the above transformer models only perform around chance on RNPC. Moreover, by looking at the errors, we found that they do make a lot of intersective interpretation errors as children do. We invite you to take a look at the interesting qualitative examples in the paper. With that, our answer to question A is no. Now let's move on to question B. Is the knowledge learnable? Well, why are we asking this question? A lot of times when a model fails on a challenge set, we don't know if it's the fault of the model or simply the data. So we try to answer the question with the inoculation by fine-tuning technique, which exposes the model to a small amount of data from the challenge set and assesses how well they can adapt. Um, so we resplit our data based on lexical overlap into a training set of up to 200 examples and a new test set of the rest. All models achieve a steady improvement on each task though MPT and EPC seem harder than SBTE. Nonetheless, given the trend, our answer to question B is at least a qualified yes. Next up is question C. What can language models learn from recursive MPs? So we hypothesize that they can learn certain linguistic features like modifier scope, but what does it mean? Consider this example. A former American diplomat and a former beginner drummer, they both start with the modifier former, which basically negates what follows it, right? But which specific word is it negating, the noun or the second modifier? In the first case, most likely it's negating diplomat because the person is no longer a diplomat, but it's probably still American, right? In the second case, it's more likely negating beginner since the person is probably still a drummer, but just no longer a beginner. So we want to see if models can learn this knowledge about modifier scope from our tasks. So we probe for this knowledge by visualizing the attention of models fine-tuned on our MPC. Given an MP, we hypothesize that the token M1 attends to more is the one that is negated or questioned by it. So we visualize the ratio R, which is the amount of attention N received over the total amount of attention M2 and N received. We plot the distribution of R when alleged is the M1. The x-axis is the magnitude of R from 0 to 1 divided at 0 0.5, and the y-axis is the frequency of R. It appears that alleged attends more to either M2 or N, depending on the MP. We highlight a few interesting cases here. On the left half, it's questioning antique in the lush antique bowl, since the object is so a bowl, but just may not be antique. But on the right half, it attends more to criminal in alleged male criminal, since the person is most likely male, but may not be a criminal. There are also some ambiguous cases in the middle. For example, an alleged ruthless criminal may neither be ruthless nor a criminal. So alleged is probably questioning both. Other modifiers like counterfeit and fraudulent show different patterns. Feel free to check out the examples yourself. In summary, our answer to question C is, from RMPC, models can learn relevant linguistic features like modifier scope and modifier semantic category, which we elaborate in the paper. 
Finally, question D. Is the knowledge used for downstream tasks? The short answer is yes. Models trained on RMPC can achieve decent zero-shot performance on an extrinsic harm detection task compared to strong baselines including GPU-3. Please see the paper for more details. So our answer to question D is also yes. In conclusion, in this work, we introduced RMPC, a challenge set targeting the understanding of recursive MPs. While it is common sense to humans, pre-trained transformers do not already have the knowledge to interpret recursive MPs. However, this knowledge is still learnable. Moreover, from RMPC, models can learn interesting linguistic features. Finally, this learned knowledge is transferable to downstream tasks like harm detection. Thanks so much for listening and please leave your questions or comments.